how we uh, manage traffic and, and traffic flows. We're still a little bit of a dinosaur. There's starting to be more innovation and adoption here, but there's no reason to have this kind of legacy inefficient traffic lights, both from a congestion standpoint and a safety standpoint. Thanks for being with us today on Transit Unplugged. Hopefully you enjoyed that interview, uh, the Yellow Transportation Reunion Show with Peggy Mayer, John Duncan, and Jeff Barnett. And I wanted to bring on, on a separate interview, a good friend of mine who I have a lot of respect for, who's been a real strong leader in our industry over his whole career, basically, and that is my friend Mark Joseph, who is well-known in the public transportation industry, clearly in North America, but also around the world. He is CEO of Mobitas Advisors, an investment firm, and they advise all kinds of transportation and other technology companies around the world. Mark, thanks for uh, taking a few minutes for me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to take us back. You and I were just talking in the green room. It was probably, uh, you know, maybe 25 years ago when you reached out to me to come work for you there at Yellow Transportation. But prior to that, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about starting Yellow Transportation. I remember your dad, when I worked there, he was still coming into the office, man, like every day. And he had law reviews that he was in charge of. I think one was Admiralty Law or something, but didn't he kind of get the company going and then you worked with him or tell me how it all started. It goes back even further, Paul. And my dad had something in common with you. You were uh, both lawyers, you're a lawyer, and, and both of you really focused on using your law and your legal background more in business than, uh, than in the practice of law. My grandfather, uh, my mother's father, had uh, started as sort of a rags to riches guy in the D.C. area with a gasoline business, a car dealership. He, he, he put himself through Georgetown with, originally with a gasoline business, then gasoline car dealership insurance company, and he partnered with a taxi company, D.C., Yellow Cab of D.C., and he and his partner split up, and late in his life, in the 1950s, he acquired Yellow Cab of Baltimore, largely to sell gasoline, to. So he was letting the tail wag the dog because he, the cab company was a big customer of his gasoline business. Uh, Baltimore at that time, post-World War II, was a bustling manufacturing city, big port city with Bethlehem Steel, General Motors, lots of other uh, major manufacturers and shipbuilding, car building, and you name it. Unfortunately, that city, uh, Baltimore, went into decline in the 60s and 70s. And I, as a 21-year-old, was asked by my dad whether I would go to Baltimore and start to see what we could do to turn around this failing family business. So that's how I had my start. And I was very fortunate because there was no downside. I couldn't screw it up uh, because the business was doing poorly. And I got the opportunity to experiment long before it was fashionable. And by the way, at that time, when I told my friends I was going to the cab business, they asked me if I was Louie because <laughs> of the TV show Taxi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> by the way, I told him my grandfather acquired it. The company Yellow Cab was one of the oldest, if not the oldest, yellow cab in the country. It was founded in 1909. We you know, celebrated our 100-year anniversary several years ago. That's right. That's great. So then, uh, so then what happened? I mean, you grew it. I, I, when I was there in the late uh, 90s, I believe you had around 700 taxi cabs, if I remember right, as part of Yellow Cab. Right. And, uh uh, you know, Dwight was there and a bunch of guys were there that were great folks running the cab business. But then somehow you got into transit too, right? Tell us about that. Yeah. So um, I was fortunate uh, to have the, the luck of finding great people like you and others who uh, helped us grow this business. We managed to turn it around. Um, and when I started, basically, we had 100 cabs, 50 that were sitting and 50 that were operating. And there was a mayor who you are well familiar with, William Donald Schaefer, uh, who had a vision for the city of how to turn around the city and how to rehabilitate it and, and uh, invest in the city, including the Inner Harbor, Camden Yards, many other important things, but also uh, the school system. Uh, it got Nancy Grasmick and other great people to help improve Baltimore and ultimately the state when he became governor. And he was an inspiration 
to me and a mentor, and he described how we need to bring and attract tourists, especially since they were going to build a new convention center in Baltimore. And all of these frontline businesses, like taxi businesses, hotels, restaurants, needed to be part of this hospitality industry. We got on board. We became a big proponent of how to uh, properly promote and and partner not only with the city and other uh, hotels and organizations, but also to empower our drivers to feel like and to be ambassadors uh, for the city. And uh, our drivers were all in uniform, and we we did we did a lot to invest in in delivering first class service. And with that came other opportunities to start diversifying the business, school bus, limousine, motor coach, paratransit. Even before it was called paratransit, uh, it was elderly and handicapped was the name of the service early on. And we started working with the MTA and other agencies, providing services for people with disabilities. I would say we were, we found synergy between our operations and um, and we were, you know, I think in a positive way, opportunistic about s- solving people's problems when it came to transportation. But none of it could have been done without the talented people who were uh, very dedicated and creative in helping to uh, uh, serve the folks that we engaged with. So, Mark, it sounds like uh, your dad brought you in when you were 21 and you worked for quite a while to get the company going. And then uh, it was. Um, I think the late nineties, you and I knew each other through Maryland, TAM and all that kind of transportation association in Maryland. Mm-hmm. We had interacted. Do you remember the process and your thoughts about when, when I came on board hiring me, because I've told that story many times about how you rec- tried to recruit me from Laidlaw for quite a while. You wanted to take yellow national. Do you remember? Yes, I do remember. Okay. I absolutely do. Let me hear your side of it, because I've never actually heard you talk about it. <laughs> well, you know, I would say, uh, and I mean this in a positive way, you were sort of a trophy hire. Uh, <laughs> in that, one of the things that as we built this business and as we became larger and more, I think, uh, important in the Baltimore, Washington market in running our transportation, all of a sudden, we became more of a target for the national players. So there were Laidlaw and other of the sort of big players uh, around the country. And I felt like we had something special in terms of how we engage with our clients, how we solve problems, and how we were part of the community. We were very much a part of the community, and that was something that uh, always uh, was important. It was important to my dad and it was important to me throughout the the lifespan of this business. So so we had diversified this business. We grew it. And uh, and one of the things we needed in order to continue to grow was to find talent who could help take us to the next level. And I always was on the lookout for really talented, bright people who were motivated and driven to to do something and be part of something that would help others. And I saw you, as you said, in, in the Transportation Association of Maryland, in other Maryland uh, activities around transportation. And as I got to know you, I, I thought your background was very interesting. Having graduated from law school, having been in the business development area, and I thought you would be a great addition to our business, but it wasn't easy to convince you to come over. Because I was always bidding against you before that. My problem, Mark, as you probably know, is I'm a true believer. And when I get in, I drink the Kool-Aid. And so I was all about Mayflower and Laidlaw. And, you know, you were the opposition. And I had never thought about working for the opposition. But you worked on me, I think, for six months. Well, I was lucky because I, you know, it was because at one, I wouldn't give up if it was someone who I felt was I could also believe in and who could be part of helping us to build it. Uh, I was uh, patient in terms of trying, uh, but uh, motivated to make it work. And for you, and I was fortunate to get others like Dwight Kimes and others who who left, who worked for a competitor and who came over, you know, and sometimes it took years to, to attract these folks. But what I remember is, that you brought a lot to us because 
we were still a family business and we didn't have the national experience. We were regional and uh, I think we lacked some of the professionalism and sophistication, especially on the bidding side and also business development activities that you brought. Plus, you had the operator's instincts and ideas, the management instincts, so you could relate well to all the folks on the operating side uh, to, uh, to be a good partner to go after this business. And you were flexible in terms of you know, what you would do in the business uh, from business development to you know, some of our executive services and, and taking on responsibility directly for some of these business units. I learned a lot from you, and I was uh, very proud of how we built that relationship. And, and I've been proud to watch you uh, evolve over the years and to find us reconnecting, uh, which I think is something when you don't burn bridges and when you maintain relationships and when you truly want to help others, sometimes uh, you know one of the keys to, in, I think, to success and to enjoy life is to maintain these relationships and to, to reconnect and see how you can help each other. Yeah, we did connect multiple times over the years. And I, uh, I've told many people this, I'm not sure I've ever told you it, but so, uh, and, and I want you to finish telling your, your story, but I just wanted to mention this later on. So you were super involved with the MTA and was a providing, uh, I think paratransit and also medical assistance transportation mm-hmm. in the city. And you had been in and around the MTA and you had actually hired Ron Hartman, who was a former mm-hmm. CEO of the MTA. So you were really familiar mm-hmm. with it. And, uh, after I left the MTA, which was six years ago now, Mark, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. But I remember when you told me, and it, it's the greatest compliment I think I've ever been paid for my time there at the MTA. And that was, you said, Paul, in the little over two years you had there, you made more changes and improvements than had probably been made in the previous 20 years combined. And uh, true. I mean, that's my badge of honor, to be honest with you. I really appreciated that. Well, it, it's absolutely true. And I think, you know, timing in life, timing's everything. And I think you got there at a good time. I think your career led up to that. And uh, I think you, you know, you weren't afraid to try new things. And one of the things that's, uh, you know, really important, and, and it is funny because we went, you know, you worked with me and then I worked, we worked for you. Yeah, uh, and, yeah, yeah. And, but... One of the things that we talk about a lot in this business is partnerships and how can we be good partners with our client and how can our client be a good partner with us? And when we say that, it isn't always, sadly, it's not always the case. Sometimes it's viewed as sort of a zero-sum proposition that uh, that the operator is just to provide drivers, maintenance, and what Ron called a body shop. Whereas in other really well-led organizations with secure, dynamic leaders, uh, they can engage in partnerships in a way that does that gets the best out of people. And I felt like when you came to MTA, you already had a vantage point, having worked uh, in the private sector with Laidlaw, with us, with the MV, and and you, and having been in the public sector as a county administrator, uh, you know, running services. So you had a a broad sort of background and vantage point. And I think you went there uh, trying to get the best out of everyone, the staff, and make them feel uh, empowered, uh, as well as the, uh, your, your contractors, vendors, partners, and others. Yeah, I think you're right. That, that's actually what Governor Hogan said to me. When he hired me, Mark, he said exactly what you just said. He said, Paul, you've got, you're an attorney, you've run county governments, you've run government organizations, and you had over 20 years in transit. I think you're the perfect guy to head the MTA. And of course, when I got there, uh, it wasn't Yellow Transportation anymore that was working for the MTA. It was another company called TransDev uh, that you were happened to be CEO of. So let's talk about that story. So near the end of my five years there, I remember um, you were working on... Um, kind of merging or selling the company. I don't know what words you would use to call it that, but to a French company at the time called Connex. And I had just run for state's attorney in my home county. And uh, you were very supportive of me in that race, by the way. I appreciated that. Mm-hmm. And I lost, but um, 
as usual, my best jobs come out of when I when I lose running for office. I've run three mm-hmm. times or when I've run for office. So I lost. But then the county commissioner hired me to be a county administrator of my home county, which was like a dream job, probably my favorite job I've ever had. And you were just in the process of selling to Connick. So I only stayed there maybe a few months after you sold. But tell us what happened mm-hmm. in that whole process and how you ended up becoming CEO of America's largest transit provider. Yeah, it is. A, it's a funny story. And I, again, you're, I think if you're open-minded and willing to see how you're going to solve the problems and, and you want to solve them at a larger scale, our, our challenge was, as I said, we saw more and more inbound competition. We had a, quite a scare uh, in Baltimore when we lost the paratransit contract, which was a big part of our business. Uh, some inexperienced operators underbid us and uh, and really mismanaged it. We were fortunate to get it back, and um, and then I decided that uh, re- really we needed to go- accelerate our growth. Ron joined, who had run the Mass Transit Administration, and Ron came to me one day and said, "Mark, you're in Young Presidents Organization YPO." He said he wanted to be a visiting professor, scholar at New York University's transportation program and that it would be one or two days of volunteer work a month. And I said, sure, why don't you do that? And he came back and said, there's a French company, the world's largest environmental company, number one in the world in water, number one in the world in waste management with a big European energy and transportation business that wants to come to the States. And uh, I said to to Ron, if they're coming to the U.S., they want to buy a business as a platform. We're not a likely platform. We had basically 10 different service lines in one major market, Baltimore, Washington, rather than one service line in 10 cities. If I were looking for a platform and I wanted school bus, if they had 10 cities uh, as opposed to uh, one market with all these different services, that would be more logical to me. But I said, I'll be polite, bring them to visit. This company, you're, you have a good memory, Connex was the transportation division. The company was Vivendi. It later became Veolia. And they owned Connex and their waste business was Onyx. And then they had uh, their water business. So one thing led to another and we hit it off and we became the platform. And we grew that business when the, the first full year of revenue was 2002, with my revenue, our revenue, Yellow Transportation's revenue of 50 million. And in six years, we were a billion in revenue by 2008, and then four more years, a billion and a half. And we grew this business to 20,000 employees, and then it ran North America, Latin America, UK, and Ireland. So running the, you know, some of the largest systems in the country, running the commuter rail in Boston, the streetcar in New Orleans, the on the bus system in Las Vegas, Phoenix, San Diego. Our manager in Boston, uh, Rich Davey, uh, Rich ran our commuter rail business. And then Duval Patrick, the governor, hired him as uh, head of the T, the MBTA, and then promoted him to secretary of transportation. Now Rich is running MTA in New York. The, it, it's one of the, the, the things I'm most happy about is to see people like you, Rich, and others who have grown either with us from Yellow Transportation through this. Uh, you know, many of these folks stayed for with me for over 20 years, some 30 years. Uh, I've gotten to see so many people grow in the industry who were connected with us in one way or another. Yeah, it's it's amazing what you did, Mark. And so you were CEO of that of that company, uh, Veolia, which now is known as TransDev, uh, for about 10 years, right? Uh, yeah, what happened is uh, Veolia uh, merged their uh, transportation business with Transdev. And so I stayed 17 years after selling the business. I was a couple years COO, 13 years as CEO. And then I was global head of development for uh, my last two years for 20 countries. Uh, and, you know, really got to see what, uh, you know, sort of the best practices were around the world. So tell us, what, what are you doing now? At the end of 2018, when I left, I started Mobitas Advisors with the idea that uh, the mobility space uh, was growing significantly and that there were new major entrants, big entrants into the world of mobility. 
On one side, you had the OEMs, the manufacturers getting into the world of mobility because they believe fleet ownership will grow, individual ownership will decline of the automobiles and other uh, types of vehicles. And on the other side, you have tech companies who are getting into the world of mobility, Google with Waymo or Alphabet with Waymo, Amazon with Zooks, and a whole host of other uh, big NVIDIA, a whole host of other tech companies. And what they have in common, and this is where uh, Mobitas comes in, is our background, yours, mine, our background is operations. And so these folks are great at building cars or great at building tech, but they're not operators. So when they want to get into the world of mobility uh, as operators, they need operating expertise. And what we learned in our business was how to not only run operations, but how to integrate technology uh, using trapeze or using other tech, whether it was outsourced tech to run our uh, routing, scheduling, dispatching, maintenance, or whether we tried to develop our own tech in various areas. But what I focus on is investing, advising, partnering between uh, some early stage uh, businesses uh, in the tech uh, space that can help Optibus, uh, and Echolane, Beep, right? Others. So Beep, Beep is a uh, is a one of the leaders now, the leader in autonomous shuttle businesses. And uh, what I think is, first of all, there's room for for all these players because the market is a multi trillion dollar uh, market. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's talk about that. Yeah. What do you, what is happening right now? I mean, you're right in the thick of it. Uh, you just, we had to take a break from this call. So you could take a, you could take a call from a big investor uh, in this world. What is happening with uh, investment and technology kind of now that hopefully COVID is in the rearview mirror and hopefully there's nothing, nothing coming anytime right in front. Where, where are we at in all this? Do you think from your perspective? First, we have some uh, major challenges uh, in our traditional space, one of which is that, uh, that there's a major driver shortage. And it's uh, across country, across the, the nation, and even around the world. Sadly, there are a lot of folks who today, younger folks who don't endeavor to become a driver, a bus driver. Uh, and so there's this question, there's a, a challenge to hire mechanics. So the labor issues, uh, we need talented people. We need people who, who can operate these, uh, these buses and maintain them and other types of vehicles. And that's, that's one, uh, driving uh, factor. And, and at the same time, you've seen billions of dollars pour into, uh, autonomous vehicles and, and various uh, state of, uh, of operation. I can say that for those who, who doubt, uh, whether uh, autonomous vehicles uh, will be uh, real and a factor in the future, I would turn them to uh, early Amazon and, and uh, e-commerce, uh, early internet businesses, or uh, cell phone, uh, smartphones, and the power of these things. For, there's no doubt in my mind we'll see uh, autonomous vehicles as part of the equation uh, in the future, and, and Beep is already demonstrating that there's a demand for this, uh, especially given some of these other challenges around drivers, maintenance. Secondly, uh, the electrification. There's a lot of change going around on the energy and the power of these vehicles and climate. You know, when we're seeing uh, 120 degree days in, in Phoenix and uh, other challenges around climate, we're seeing uh, a commitment even in the reddest of states towards looking for solutions around you know energy and clean energy and you're seeing billions and billions of dollars being invested in this area and this does relate to to our industry and mobility uh and including what you think about batteries now hydrogen is was uh, in las vegas uh, mj is is uh, was part of that uh last bit has got uh, part of the bid to require hydrogen-powered uh, vehicles. So learning how to maintain and operate these vehicles and think about this. Then on the software side, which you're very familiar with, there's all kinds of uh, new ways thinking about the improved routing, whether it's microtransit, whether it's a traditional fixed bus routing scheduling, whether it's uh, micro-mobility, 
whether it's uh, paratransit and other areas, software is, uh, is continuing to play a key role. So from an investor standpoint, uh, I see a lot of enabling technology and I see some disruptive, some uh, disruptive technology. And when it comes to disruption, we've seen what happened with Uber and Lyft, both on the positive and the negative. But for sure, there's more disruption to come. And I would just say that we need to see how to navigate that and how to position the transit agencies to play a key role in managing the, the transportation and coordinating transportation in cities. And one last point, traffic is, uh, is also a major issue and how we uh, manage traffic and, and traffic flows. We're still a little bit of a dinosaur. There's starting to be more innovation and adoption here, but there's no reason to have this kind of legacy inefficient traffic lights, both from a congestion standpoint and a safety standpoint. Well, that's a great segue to really my last kind of technical question, which is uh, artificial intelligence. I mean, that seems like an area, traffic lights and traffic management, that's ripe for the implementation of AI. Um, how do you see public transportation position ourselves to take advantage of AI? Well, uh, certainly in terms of, of processing information and thinking about scenarios, for instance, AI, when you're looking at safety, Waymo has driven more miles than anybody else in, in autonomous vehicles, some millions of miles, but hundreds of times, thousands of times more simulation uh, using AI to look at these kind of edge case scenarios and run through these scenarios and see how you train uh, the vehicle. So there's lots of AI in this uh, industry to, to think about it in a positive way to affect safety or how to interact uh, with customers, how to serve customers, how to anticipate uh, how routes or traffic should change, uh, what time of day, what type of conditions, how to think on the fly and use the power of uh, this kind of artificial intelligence to solve problems at a rate that humans simply, simply cannot. But then you also have to worry about this destructive side about it, cyber attacks or people who mismanage the AI. And so, you know, I think we need to, as an industry, come together with, uh, you know, how can this, how can this be helpful to, uh, to manage our systems better and to make them safer at the same time? How do we prevent this from getting out of control? And one last point is jobs. Uh, you know, I talked about, we need uh, to find the people who will do these jobs, but we also think, have to think about not protecting a job that is antiquated or obsolete, but protecting the people who need to work. So for instance, you know, people always point to elevator operators and say, well, we don't have elevator operators anymore. But I think, for instance, in, in autonomous vehicles in our industry, if we could move the driver from the front of the bus to the back of the bus, we'd have a much better service. So for people with disabilities, for school children, for even for uh, our, our uh, transit riders, if that driver could do other things because the vehicle could drive itself, imagine what you could do in terms of educating students on the ride or helping people with disabilities. The customer experience could be vastly better. And uh, so that, that's what I'm thinking about. That's great. Good stuff, Mark. Well, thank you for, uh, for sharing so much of your time with us today so generously. I know you your time is very valuable, but it was great to look back uh, on this part two of our reunion show from Yellow Transportation and then look forward to where we're headed. Thank you so much for that and for uh, sharing time with us. Any last words you want to share? Well, someone asked me at my age, and I'm older than you, someone asked me, why do you keep uh, doing this? Uh, you know, why don't you think about retirement? And I tell them because for me, now is the most interesting time in, in the more than 30 years in this business, I think now is the most exciting time to be in the business. I think we can together and with people like you and, uh, and others in the industry who are forward thinking and collaborative, uh, we can solve problems that will make, uh, make our world better for our kids and for our grandchildren. Mark Joseph, thank you so much for being our guest on Transit Unplugged. Thank you for having me, Paul. Great to see you.
Hi, I'm Alea Carey, a communications consultant who loves working with public transit agencies. Let's wrap up this three-part series on your own communications channels. These are the marketing tools that you don't buy or pay for, the ones you have a lot of control over yourself, your website, your newsletter, and today, your blog. Let's face it, sometimes a blog is where transit news goes to die. It's often the last of our owned channels that we think of. It can feel dutiful and boring to write, and we don't always do everything we could to make blog posts fresh and interesting. That's because, hey, we're busy, and writing is surprisingly hard work. Wouldn't it be great to have a writing partner to inspire you to write more interesting, engaging blog posts? Enter AI. Yeah, that's right, artificial intelligence. I'm not talking about writing with AI. AI written docs are lackluster. They don't have a point of view or any human insight. AI writing will never replace the real thing. But it turns out AI makes a pretty good brainstorming partner when you're trying to write. For example, check out ChatGPT or OpenAI Playground. You can pose questions on these platforms and get a rapid response that you could then use to shape a piece you'll write yourself. For example, I recently asked, what does a vacationing family need to know about using public transit in Astoria, Oregon? And I got an 11-point response that could be used to write a blog post. You might ask an AI engine, what are the top three benefits of using a transit app? Or what's the safest way to take a bike on public transit? Do you know these things yourself? Of course you do. Do you sometimes forget them and leave them out of important communications because you're tired and maybe a little overworked? Of course you do. AI isn't a substitute for your own good thinking, but it could serve as a helpful jog to your memory and a way of organizing your information. If you'd like to talk more about crazy ideas like using artificial intelligence as a thought partner or anything else related to communications and public transit, look me up on LinkedIn. My first name is spelled E-L-E-A, last name C-A-R-E-Y. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Transit Unplugged with our special guest, Mark Joseph, CEO of Mobitas Advisors. Now, coming up next week on the show, we have another look inside the world of commuter rail with Mike Noland, president and general manager of the South Shore Line that connects northern Indiana to Chicago. It's a great interview with some really great insights into the future of commuter rail. Now, while you're listening, if you could do us a favor and rate and review Transit Unplugged wherever you listen to podcasts, we'd really appreciate it. Rating and reviewing helps other people find Transit Unplugged and become part of our transit community. If you have a question, comment, or would like to be a guest on the show, feel free to email us anytime at info at transitunplugged.com. Transit Unplugged is brought to you by Medaxo at Medaxo. We're passionate about moving the world's people. And at Transit Unplugged, we're passionate about telling those stories. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy.